Ellie here. Today's video is brought to you by Surfshark, but more on that in a bit. Hello my friends, how are you? Sean Ferrick here for Trek Culture. I've said it before, I'll say it again. You know me, I love ships. I love playing with model ships, I love seeing them fly around. Good lord, didn't any of you build ships in a bottles when you were kids? Please tell me you get the reference. I'm sure you do. With all of that, we are going to have a look at those ships that had a bit more of a, shall we say, rushed production schedule. Some of them may surprise you, others may haunt and scar you the rest of your lives. I'm Sean Ferrick for Trek Culture and here are 10 legendary Star Trek kit bashes. Number 10, the Proto Nebula class. The USS Melbourne was introduced in the Best of Both Worlds Part 2. Well, I say introduced. The ship itself had been introduced by name in Part 1, with the appearance happening in Part 2. We have come to understand and expect a Nebula class now to have that triangular shaped sensor dome, for want of a better word, above the very galaxy class saucer section, but that was not always the case. In fact, the Proto Nebula class had two smaller warp nacelles where that triangular piece was going to be. Two physical models of this Proto Nebula USS Melbourne were built. One was going to be heavily damaged and destroyed to be shown in the debris field after the Battle of All 359. The other was then kept and used for a display piece in Captain Riker's ready room in the episode Future Imperfect. It's also the only kit bash that was seen in both the Best of Both Worlds Part 2 and Emissary as it was glimpsed through the window of Sisko's escape pod from the Saratoga. There is the long-standing story of Emissary also introducing an Excelsior class USS Melbourne. So in the universe, the Excelsior USS Melbourne was already in service with this new USS Melbourne being rushed into release to face the Borg. And I bet they'd wish they'd left it in space dock. Number nine, USS Elkins. The Elkins is barely shown on screen in the season six opener of Deep Space Nine, A Time to Stand. The script called for a battered Federation fleet to be limping back toward their territory after having seven levels of shite knocked out of them by the Dominion. To fill out the numbers of this fleet, they called for several new ships to be created, one of which was the USS Elkins, which was named after VFX designer Judy Elkins. The body was based on parts from an F-14 jet. The nacelle struts were based on the Danube class runabout and the nacelles themselves were borrowed from the Miranda class. Number eight, Intrepid Type. The Intrepid Type appeared in Star Trek Enterprise and it's heavily based on Doug Drexler's design for the NX-01. The Saucer section itself was halved, as well as the nacelles being swung up and stuck to that half saucer section. This was an example of CGI kit bashing rather than model kit bashing. And by model kit bashing, I mean, of course, taking pieces that were commercially available. This, according to senior CG supervisor Rob Bonchoon, was a case of having to deal with creating these new designs with precious little turnaround time. In fact, this one, while it got some of the most screen time of any support vessels from Starfleet in Enterprise, they didn't really refer to it as anything until it was named Intrepid Type on screen. It was generally referred to as the one with the half saucer right up until it, with its additional numbers, helped to support NX-01 in the various battles against the Zindi and whatever time traveling nonsense was happening that week. Number seven, the Challenger class. The Challenger class, so named by designer Ed Miarecki, was named after the Space Shuttle, and it was unique among Star Starfleet starships at the time that the two nacelles were not perfectly in line with each other. This technically broke Gene Roddenberry's rule of line of sight. In fact, Miarecki originally designed the ship with only one nacelle, but Mike Okuda would go on to suggest that maybe adding a second one would help to fill out the overall design. Okuda then said that actually he regretted that bit of advice because it made the ship look a bit like a lollipop. The Baran was one of 39 vessels that were lost at Wolf 359 and you can see it as the Enterprise slides into the field of destruction 
in the best of both worlds part two. What up my dudes, it's Chad Tarka. Some people think I might be a famous meteorologist. I like to think I'm just a friend of the weather. Right now I'm back on Riser looking after my mom and I'm about to head out there again. I really want to watch season 19 of Love Dex. So of course I turn to the totally bodacious VPN, Surfshark. No matter where I am, I can watch Geolock shows at the press of a button. Face is disease and death, wrapped in darkness and silence. But Surfshark's antivirus program keeps me totally tubular. And their righteous online security means I can keep my research private before publication. My dudes, the risk is zilch. And Surfshark offer a 30-day money-back guarantee. And as you're all friends of this fine institution, Trek Culture, they're going to give you an exclusive Black Friday deal, which is six months free if you go to their site and use the code TREKCULTURE, surfshark.deals forward slash TREKCULTURE. You know it's rad when it comes from your friend Chad. Number six, the Jaeger class. I'm not going to lie to you folks. I hate this ship. I hate it. And because of that, I'm kind of delighted to have the model. I mean, I mean, I mean, look at it. The model was designed by Gary Hutzel and it was actually praised by Mike Okuda because, I mean, whatever else you want to say about it, it is an immediately recognizable silhouette. Like you look at this and you know it's not an Enterprise. The model was built from commercially available Voyager and Maquis Raider model kits. It was often seen then in various episodes of Deep Space Nine as a ship that was lazily floating by the station. Now, this was never shown in a close-up, high-definition way. So if we ever do get around to that long-fabled remaster of Deep Space Nine, you have to wonder. I can appreciate the absolute ingenuity of taking these two ships and sticking them together and throwing them in the back. Doesn't mean that I like it. Number five, Curry class. The Curry class that was introduced in another of the ships introduced in Deep Space Nine's A Time to Stand was named after famed artist Dan Curry. He designed this ship to be one of the fleet that was limping its way back to Federation space with their tails between their legs. He came up with the kit bash for the Curry class in just a few hours, raiding the boxes of model kits and coming up with pieces of Excelsior and Miranda class ships. For the overall shape, of the vessel, he took inspiration from World War II landing craft. This is, they had the engines toward the back, the saucer section there, but they had the shuttle craft or the shuttle bay right up the front. So think of those landers on D-Day where the front drops down and, well, unfortunately, a lot of people never came home again. Now, despite the ship only being on screen for seconds, it was one of the ones that Eagle Moss commissioned for their collection I have to say, I really like it. Number four, Cheyenne class. This four nacelled vessel was, if you like, something of a spiritual sequel to the Constellation class, USS Stargazer, USS Hathaway, and USS Constance. This was another one of those very quick kit bashes that was put together for the Wolf 359 fleet. Uh, it has the legend of being one of the luckier ships. And when I say one of, I mean the luckier ship. The Awani was the only vessel to survive the Borg invasion and the Borg destruction at Wolf 359 as it would return as part of Picard's fleet in Redemption. Designer Ed Miarecki built the ship using commercially available parts of the Galaxy class and also, and it will not be the only time on this list, highlighter pens were used as well. Number three, New Orleans class. The New Orleans class had something of a false start when it came to Star Trek The Next Generation. When it came to new designs, the Galaxy class, the Constellation class, and even later on the Ambassador class were all major new designs for the series, with Excelsior, Oberth, and Miranda class filling out some of the gaps in Starfleet. Now, this left the impression that Starfleet was generally staffed by much older vessels. So Ed Miarecki was given the task, create something new that we can use to fill out the gaps. The New Orleans class is a put together of the Galaxy class saucer section and the Galaxy class star drive section. Now the nacelle struts are swept back and up, but it wasn't enough. So 
the feedback came down of you've got to give it something a little bit extra. And those marker pens, three marker pens were added, two to the top and one underneath to give the New Orleans class its own distinctive look. With this design, it was ready to go into service once as the USS Kyushu, the best of both worlds part two. Didn't get a lot of screen time. Number two, Springfield class. The Springfield class was another of the Ed Miorek kit bashes that were put together for the Battle of 0359. The only known model that was built was to be named the USS Chekhov, named after Pavel Chekhov, but it would then only be seen burning in space. The main saucer section was based on the Galaxy class saucer section with, you guessed it, some more marker pens used for nacelles. However, it had a separate secondary hull, complete with its own Galaxy Glass inspired deflector dish as well, giving it quite a distinctive silhouette. Two changes were made to the USS Chekhov in The Best of Both Worlds Part 2. The first was that the spelling of the name was changed. So rather than C-H-E-C-K-O-F, which is Pavel Chekhov, it was changed to drop the additional C and then just became Chekhov as in the playwright. The second change, when it was deemed too depressing to have the name of an original series character called out among the dead of Wolf 359, is that it was changed to the USS Tolstoy when being said out loud by Shelby. Number one, Centaur class. The Centaur class went from one of the briefest glimpses to becoming one of the most beloved extra designs of a starship in the franchise. The story of how it came to be is quite a funny one. Adam Buckner, who had been working under Gary Hutzel, was tasked with coming up for new designs for Deep Space Nine's A Time to Stand. Before this, however, between seasons five and six, he had gone traveling and was using this time to try and come up with new ship ideas. He was traveling in Spain and he met a young man named Guillermo. In the course of chatting, he promised Guillermo a ship of his very own. Flash forward now to production on time to stand and the order came in, it's like, look, we need a ship that's gonna be seen moving fast. We don't need massive amount of detail on it because it's gonna, you know, it'll be in shot, but it's gonna be da -da 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 -da, zipping in and out and heading off again. So Buckner taking parts of the Excelsior class and the Miranda class put together with little extra bits stuck on and some UV strips to create the blue of the nacelles created what we then found to be the Centaur. And that could have been the end of it, but it wasn't because years later, the Centaur would return in Star Trek Resurgence. It would also appear as part of the unlucky fleet that faces off against the living construct in Star Trek Prodigy. Now, both times it was refined a little in terms of the design, but still it was that original Centaur. And yes, Buckner did get a model of the Centaur to Guillermo. That's everything for our list, folks. Thank you very, very much. What did you think? Do you like lists about these sort of lesser known ships? Let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to get in touch with us over on Twitter at Trek Culture, on Instagram at Trek Culture YT, on both Blue Sky and TikTok as well. I'm at Sean Ferrick on the various socials. You are wonderful. You are fantastic. Give a bit of love to the editor who looked after this video. Zeti dovo if prostvitati. And to our friends in the Middle East, we pray for a quick and safe ceasefire. Everyone look after yourselves, stay safe, make it so.